welcome to Culture on I-24 News. I'm Adil Grober, and today we've got a wonderful show for you. Music scholar Chris Silver will tell us about the music of the Maghreb. The Israeli beach game of Matkot is getting a facelift. And we'll hear about the interview Obama gave to comedian Mark Marin. Chris Silver is an American historian and music scholar in the history department at UCLA. His uh, research focuses on the role Jewish musicians had in the North African music scene in the 20th century. I'm very happy to have him here in the studio to tell us all about it and play some music. Thanks for uh, coming in, Chris. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. So, uh, a young American historian, how do you end up researching uh, music from North Africa? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I've long been drawn to North Africa, uh, former French North Africa, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Um, just sort of loved how it was sort of, people have described it as the ain't. So it ain't Southern Europe, it ain't Sub-Saharan <laughs> Africa, it ain't the Middle East, so what is it? So I was always drawn to North Africa. Uh, and then it's almost difficult not to talk about Jewish musicians when you talk about the music industry in North Africa. Um, so I sor sort of have a, um, a personal interest in music dating back to my father who was in the American uh, music industry. And it happened a few years ago that I was in Morocco, stumbled into a record store, um, and the rest is sort of history, as they say. What happened? Um, so I asked for sort of a musical tour, uh, tour from the proprietor. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this beautifully preserved record store, um, the same stock that was there in the 1970s. Um, the men working <laughs> there are actually potentially wearing the same, the same clothes, <laughs> large lapels, bell bottoms, and things like that, 70s style uh, mustaches. And I said, can you sort of like show me what's going on here? Give me a tour, pull some records off the shelves, and let's hear it. I, w I hadn't really heard uh, North African music before, not Moroccan music. Um, and after every record was spun, the proprietor would say, oh, and by the way, that musician was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of piqued my interest. I bought a few things. And I sort of became very interested in what happened to these Jewish musicians post independence, 1950s, 1960s, uh, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Um, and then once I got to that point, uh, I wanted to sort so of know what the, exactly what the origin of this was. And what did you find? Why did uh, Jewish musicians play such a significant role? It's a fantastic question. That's what I do a lot of my research on. It, it's also very <laughs> to, complicated. To, you know. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's a mix of things. Um, there's a certain um, Jewish predilection for music. Okay. Um, in some cases, there's more general antipathy to music. So um, it was sort of seen in the past as a lower class um, trade and profession. So sort of there's a number of pull, push and pull factors. Um, but also there's sort of there's a network that plays a role here. So not only were Jews involved in um, performing as vocalists and instrumentalists, mm -hmm. but also uh, acted as concessionaires for international record companies in North Africa, also owned cafes and music venues, and also uh, sold alcohol, uh, which is a very important uh, social lubricant <laughs> and musical lubricant as well. Um, and so all of these things came together um, really at the very beginning of the 20th century, um, sort of unfolded in a commercial right. way. Um, Do we still feel the effect of those days today? Oh, absolutely. So um, you can easily be walking down the street in Casablanca or Fez or even Tunis and, first of all, hear that music being played right. as performed by Jewish musicians many decades ago. Mm -hmm. um, but also it's very much a subject of conversation. So um, really the mention of a name. Yeah. Um, from, let's say, 1920s Tunisia um, sort of brings back a flood of nostalgia uh, and memories for people. And even if they don't quite remember the musician, right, sometimes there's sort of a discrepancy between mm -hmm. the age of the person you're speaking with um, and uh, when that music came out, um, it is a topic of conversation and it can sort of shift um, it can shift the way a conversation goes. All right, so uh, uh, you have some examples for sure. us. You're going to take us on a, a, a small tour. tour. Yeah. Uh, what are we going to hear? 
I think the first thing we're going to hear is, and it looks like I'm right, is uh, something by Salim Halali, uh, who is an Algerian Jew, uh, born in, I believe, 1920, um, was described as um, having the most beautiful Arab voice of the post-war era, but he actually got his start uh, in the 1930s. And this is a fascinating clip. It's sort of an early music video. Um, and he's singing here an Arabic version of My Yiddish Mama. <laughs> so uh, let's check it out in Algerian Yiddish Mama. Oh, my Yiddish Mama. Ah, ya ma sahar tilayali. So I know a slightly different version, but this is great. Uh, he's he's got How a beautiful voice. How did the Yiddish mama get to get there? So I mean, he, Halali is a fascinating figure. Um, born and raised in Algeria. Um, spends World War II years in Paris, which mm. is itself sort of a very complicated story. Opens a cabaret in Casablanca in the 1950s, which is quite popular, and then ends up in France again. So he was in touch with uh, French Jewish communities, mm -hmm. and he was also a person who sort of um, erred toward the eccentric. So. Um, this is sort of, in some ways, surprising, but not surprising at all if when considering the personality. With, yeah, exactly, right, right, exactly. Right. Well, it's awesome. Uh, what else do you have? So the next piece we're going to see is also sort of a, it's, it's a staged piece. Um, and what they're performing here is a very famous song called Sidi Mansour. Um, which, um, if we have the music, you might recognize. Um, but on Darbuka is a figure by the name of Al Kahlawi Tunisi, uh, who is a Tunisian Jew um, who ends up in Paris in the neighborhood of Belleville um, and takes over a record label called Dunia, which means world. And he sort of welcomed um, to France all these North African mm -hmm. uh, Jewish musical exiles. Um, and they're careers continued in, in large part thanks to him. So you can see that he's also a character. Let's check it out. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Yeah, he is the man who can have his eyes on the woman dancing while playing the darbuka <laughs> with, the fero yeah, with ferocity. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, certainly a, a skill one should appreciate. <laughs> Chris, uh, thanks so much. It was uh, very interesting and, and uh, uh, great music as well. Thank you for having me. Now, summer is uh, officially started this week, and uh, in Israel, the beaches are already bustling with the local racket game of matkot. But this summer, two inventors are uh, suggesting an alternative to this extremely enjoyable but noisy game. Can they change the national seaside experience? Shachar Pered went to find out. <laughs> time of the year again, when Israeli beaches are filled with the buzz of people, the rhythm of waves, and the sound of a ball hitting a wooden racket. But this year, a new kind of racket brings a new kind of silence. It's a different game. Uh, it's a game that is way faster. You can reach a higher level of technique with it. Uh, you can enjoy it without disturbing the environment, without disturbing other people. The popular Israeli game of matkot is both an attraction and a nuisance in the Israeli beach, especially because of its noisy and loud feature. But one of the purposes of this new racket is to change that. 
The handle is made of three layers of polymer to allow the hand to sink in and hold it firmly. These are professional tennis wires and the racket itself is made out of carbon, the top technology for tennis rackets today. Childhood friends Guy Shapira and Amit Sharon, a passionate inventor and a high-tech businessman respectively, came up with the idea three years ago. There's a variety of sports games at the beach like football and volleyball, but not tennis. Since the tennis rackets we know aren't suitable for the beach and are also noisy, I thought about creating a hybrid between the common Israeli matkot, or for example the Brazilian fresco, and the tennis racket. Among the matkot lovers, opinions are divided. Part of the fun is the noise and I guess to a bit to annoy other people. And usually when you play you hear the other people playing and it's part of the fun. This looks like something that could be great fun, first and foremost, for the people sitting on the beach who won't suffer from the ting, ting, ting sound. But let's give it a try. One step before mass production, the two entrepreneurs turned to Kickstarter for funding. The idea is to really approach the community, the community of people that are into fun, into games, into beach, into sport activities, and, and let them pre-order the Kapow rackets uh, and, and help us fund the, the project this way. Both avid Matko players themselves, they insist their new project is no replacement for the original game. I will never dream of replacing the Matkot. It's like the national flag. We simply added another beach racket game. Will beach lovers welcome Kapawa or not? Only summer will tell. In a moment, we'll hear about some interesting web series. But first, here's our cultural recommendation for today. Experience Argentina's artists. This is what Paula Eisenberg and Albertine Galbert proposed at the gallery Le Maison Rouge. In My Buenos Aires, the two curators wish to invite the public to a very particular universe. Paintings, sculptures, installations, videos and photos. Works of 60 Argentine artists come together to create this atmosphere of strong feelings and energy that we can feel on every street corner of the Argentine capital. Famous artists like Guillermo Cuitca or Leon Ferrari, alongside young artists who are yet to be discovered. This display invites the public to step into the mystery of Buenos Aires Iris without attempting to solve it after Winnipeg in 2011 and Johannesburg in 2013. Now it's time to make sense of Buenos Aires at La Maison Rouge in Paris. And now from the tube we're joined by Shai Ringel. Hi Shai. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, fine. We're talking about uh, culture from the web. Yeah. And First and foremost, yeah. POTUS. POTUS. A, a very, very nice and I think one of the most, more uh, famous podcasts out there is WTF, WTF by Mark Maroon. Mark Maroon is a stand-up comedian. He's a, he's a kind of stand-up for stand-ups, but mm -hmm. his podcast is uh, uh, very famous for uh, interviewing a lot of other comedians. Mm -hmm. But this week he got to interview the president of the United States mm -hmm. who came into his garage. Who can garage. tell a joke. He's not a comedian, yeah, but he yeah. can tell a joke. He can tell a joke, but he came to his garage uh. in Pasadena. <laughs> um, you know, just this guy's better, garage. To, better than uh, Between Two Ferns. Yeah, but still, Between Two Ferns was filmed in the White House. This is just this guy's garage yeah. uh, but it was a very interesting uh, podcast and it was an hour interview yeah uh, where the uh, obama had the chance to just relax and talk about his presidency you know as a whole yeah and uh, but he, that's not what uh, most uh, no. uh news outlets picked up on no uh, most news uh, outlets picked out uh small moment where Obama talked about racism and he said that uh, the fact that less people are saying the n-word is not to say that there's less racism out there right now and he used the n-word he used the n-word itself and um, 
and people picked up on that next yeah year. fox news picked yeah, up yeah, a lot yeah. about that but the interview itself uh, it, it didn't had a lot of revelations but it it was a very nice and relaxed time with the president yeah. which is something Certainly worth worth checking out uh you have some uh, other uh stuff for us uh, yeah. funny stuff yeah we're talking about a new uh, uh a new season for a web show called the untitled web series that Morgan Evans is doing. Yeah, good uh, name. Catchy. Yeah, it's a very good name. <laughs> the first season was backed by Kickstarter. This season uh, will be uh, backed by MTV, which is very nice for him. He's starting to is do that, is more money. Is that not going to be the untitled web series? It's going to be the untitled it's going to be MTV the untitled, series? Yeah, it's going to be the untitled web series that Morgan Evans is doing for MTV. MTV. Yeah. Uh, but the first season was very, very funny. Uh, Morgan Evans is a stand-up comedian from New York. Uh, very young, very successful. Worth checking out. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jai. Thank you. That's uh, it from us for today. I hope you enjoyed our show. We'll be here tomorrow as well, so uh, please feel free to join us. Mm -hmm.